we're going to be talking about some latest treatments for heart valve problems, so emerging structural heart procedures. So these are some newer devices. Actually, they've been around for a couple of years now, but again, really want to give the public an idea of what we're doing differently and what we can do differently for patients who have certain heart valve problems. So let's go with the background. Historically, a number of cardiac conditions could only be treated with open heart surgery. Well, given the increasing age of our population, in addition to the multiple comorbid issues involved, the risk of complications of operating on this population has also gone up. Medical technology has made leaps and bounds in the last decade in regard to treating cardiovascular disorders. So a little bit more of the background. 30 years ago, use of a coronary balloon, which we call PTCA, followed by stents, which is called PCI, revolutionized acute coronary syndromes, basically heart attacks. So that basically means 30 some odd years ago, if you came to the emergency room with chest pain and was told you were having a heart attack, the only thing we really could do at the time was to administer a blood thinning medication through an IV, which was okay, but clearly needed to be replaced with something more thorough, scientifically based, and obviously that worked better. And that's where stents and balloons came about. Then we saw also that people who had heart rhythm disorders really needed a treatment and we had to figure something out that couldn't be just a bulky machine that they walked around with. And pacemakers came along and actually revolutionized people with heart rhythm disorders. But the one major area in the heart that we didn't address or hadn't addressed was valvular issues. So the coronary blockages were addressed, the pacemakers were addressing the rhythm issues, but we still needed to find a way to treat problems with the heart valve conditions. So we have a structural heart revolution. We call it a revolution, not just evolution. We now have the capability to address serious internal cardiac issues with minimally invasive techniques. Results with certain procedures have now shown to be equivalent, if not better, than certain conditions with open heart standard of care. And this movement only seems to be gaining strength with newer technologies entering the cardiac arena every year. So the heart has four valves, the pulmonic valve, the tricuspid valve, the mitral valve, and the aortic valve. Due to this timing tonight, of uh, the limited time we have, I wanted to really hone in on two specific conditions of the heart. One of them we're gonna talk about is mitral regurgitation. The mitral valve is a valve that sits on the left side of the heart, connects the left atrium to the left ventricle, and regurgitation means leaking. So think of it as a leaking mitral valve is what we're gonna talk about first. This condition affects thousands of Americans and is vastly undertreated. It basically means the mitral valve has become leaky with blood spilling backwards into the lungs rather than going forward into the left ventricle as a result of a weak or degenerated mitral leaflet. So think about a door opening and then a door having its hinges broken and it's just flopping back and forth. And that's basically what we're seeing when a mitral valve stops working the way it should. It results in people having shortness of breath, fatigue, and eventually, if not treated, heart failure. So what causes mitral regurgitation or a leaking mitral valve? Well, we do know something is called degenerated or degenerative mitral regurg is usually due to an anatomic abnormality of the mitral valve itself, including the leaflets or the subvalvular apparatus, such as the cords that attach the leaflet itself. If you could see this slide there, you could see on the left side of the screen is a normal mitral valve. But as you could go across to the right, there's different etiologies and showing you what happens when the mitral valve itself becomes dysfunctional. Functional MR is known as secondary MR. It's the result of left ventricular dilatation. What that means is that the left ventricle gets dilated, it gets wider. And when it gets wider, it actually stretches the mitral leaflets out Hence, you stretch the door, then you'll have more leaking that goes through it. Moderate or severe valvular disease is common and increases with age. 
Mitral regurgitation is the most common type of heart valve insufficiency in the US. It increases with age and it rises to 9.3 for over 75 year olds. This is a condition that we see quite often when we perform something called an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. We oftentimes see leaking mitral valves, though they might be trivial or mild, but it's a sign potentially that things may change as time goes on. Because MR, mitral regurg, progresses to heart failure if not treated. So why does that happen? Well, the leaking across the mitral valve over time eventually leads to more pressure on the left ventricle because blood is going backwards, not forwards. And what happens is that the left ventricle will then squeeze more to get the blood out of the heart, which causes more blood to go across that mitral valve. With the mitral valve leaking into the pulmonary circulation from the left atrium, people get more short of breath. They start having more symptoms. So what happens is the left ventricle tries to compensate, and as time goes on, you have a vicious circle of increased load stress, leading to muscle damage, leading to dysfunction of the left ventricle, eventually dilating the left ventricle, and again, that just begets itself with more mitral regurgitation. And if this is untreated, severe MR can progress to death in nearly 57% of cases. So how do we treat mitral regurgitation? Well, historically, only medical therapy followed by open heart surgery, if possible, were mainstays of treatment. Medical therapy is very effective to treat acute mitral regurgitation, especially if it's from a volume issue. So if someone comes into the ER short of breath with fluid in their lungs because the mitral valve is leaking, we can give them things like Lasix. It's a water pill that we can give them through their IV to get fluid out of their lungs. The problem is, once we get that fluid out, well, guess what happens over time? It reaccumulates unless that mitral regurgitation is fixed. So surgery has historically been the gold standard and still is. However, surgery can oftentimes be high risk in this particular population and needs to be done by a surgeon with the skill and experience to perform a mitral valve replacement or repair. And I'll be honest, we're blessed here in Boulder to have two fantastic surgeons that work at Boulder Community Health, Dr. Brian Mahan and Dr. Dan O'Hare. Dr. O'Hare especially specializes in robotic mitral valve repair. And Dr. Mahan as well performs hundreds, if not thousands in his history of open mitral valve repair and replacement. So our patient population can get the benefit of a surgical expertise. But even with this surgical expertise, there are patients who are just too high risk to have either robotic or open mitral valve repair. And those are the patients we oftentimes have to focus on because they have the highest mortality level. So into this situation came the mitral clip. The mitral clip is a percutaneous, which means it goes through the skin into a vein, doesn't open the chest and doesn't go through the side of the chest, a device that goes into the heart and literally clips the mitral valve. And what does that mean? Well, that means it actually goes into the mitral valve and where it was leaking, we try to put a clip in there to clip it and keep it from opening as much and, le and basically leading to less regurgitation. So we know the outcomes over the last 10 years performing this mitral clip procedure has actually been quite beneficial for patients. We've seen decreased hospitalizations and we've seen a number of patients getting discharged early after this procedure is performed. Again, we don't utilize this procedure for patients who are low risk or intermediate risk for surgery because surgery is still the gold standard for this condition. But if we have a 85 year old or 90 year old person who has other issues going on, kidney failure, uh, coronary disease, things of that nature that make them higher risk for open heart, this device then fits quite nicely into that niche. And I'd like to show you what it actually looks like and how we deploy this so you have an idea. So we're gonna go ahead and play this. This is the device itself outside the body. When I first saw this 10 years ago or 12 years ago, I thought it was something out of Star Trek because I couldn't believe this would actually work and actually do what it's supposed to, but amazingly, it does. Here is a catheter going into the heart. We make something called a transeptal puncture, which the patients do not feel this, and this hole will close after the catheter is pulled back. 
we then introduce the mitra clip sheath into the left side of the heart. And then we introduce the mitra clip itself. And amazingly, it can bend. We can actually directionally place this in numerous places across the heart. And that's the clip as it's open. And what you're seeing there, that red coming backwards, is blood regurgitating into the left atrium. We then open our grippers and open our arms and close the arms to test everything. We then place the clip below the leaflets of the mitral valve and we go ahead and clip it just like that. And if we're not happy with how we clip it, we can release it and try it again and put it in a different position. And that's how we clip the valve. And once we do that, we create something called an owl eye. This looks like an owl and its eyes. And that's how we know we have the tissue in the clip. And if we're happy, we go ahead and pull the clip back. And you can see on the left is what we like. And on the right is what mitral regurgitation looks like without the clip. So with that and the space of time, I'm going to move forward and I'm going to jump to another valve and another condition. So we just talked about the mitral valve and it leaking called regurgitation. Now I'm going to jump to the aortic valve and something different, something called stenosis. So what is stenosis? That is a calcification or immobility of the valve to open. So rather than a door that broke its hinges and is flopping back and forth, think of a door that's completely locked and not opening at all. And that's basically what you have when you have a stenotic valve. The aortic valve is the valve that connects the heart, basically, to the aorta. It's the final gateway from the heart to the rest of the body. Hence, a very, very important valve. So aortic stenosis can be seen earlier in life as a congenital issue whether it be a bicuspid valve, which means there's two leaflets instead of three, but can also be seen more often as a calcific age-related issue. It's a very real problem in the US. It, aortic stenosis can result in closure of the aortic valve, which can cause progressive chest pain, lightheaded spells, passing out spells, and eventual heart failure or death if not treated. So what is the prevalence of aortic stenosis? It is estimated to be prevalent up to 7% of the population over the age of 65, more likely to affect men than women, and 80% of the adults with symptomatic aortic stenosis are males. That being said, this is an old adage, who comes for medical care oftentimes? Men. A lot of women will be at home taking care of their children, taking care of the house, even working, doing all three, and hence we don't see as many women come in and complain about these symptoms. So I would actually argue that men and women to some extent proportionally have this condition. What are the demographics? Well, again, aortic stenosis is 2% of the population over 65, but the conditions below it, sclerosis, sclerosis is just scarring of the valve leaflets, which can lead to aortic stenosis. So once we start seeing that, we know that over time, a patient can develop that aortic stenosis valve. So what causes it? I get this question all the time. A patient will say to me, hey, I had an ultrasound of my heart, which is called an echocardiogram. They said that I have calcium on my valve. Should I stop drinking milk? Absolutely not. That is not a relationship of your dietary calcium intake and what's on your valve. Oftentimes, the calcium on the aortic valve is age-related. Could it be genetic? Possibly as well, but I will tell you it's not dietary from a milk standpoint. So if you're taking calcium supplementation, continue to do that because obviously osteoporosis is very important to treat. So you can see here that age-related calcific aortic stenosis is the most common. We used to see rheumatic fever changes on these valves, not as much in this day and age. And then we do see congenital abnormalities, like we mentioned, the bicuspid aortic valves, but those patients tend to present to the medical centers or to the doctors in their fourth and fifth and sixth decade of life versus the age-related calcific stenosis, which is usually seventh or eighth decade in life. 
So risk factors, age, gender, hypertension, smoking, to be honest, these risk factors aren't per se aortic stenosis. This is mostly for vascular disease. So if you have any of these risk factors, I would be more concerned that, okay, is there a risk for coronary disease or vascular disease? Less likely aortic stenosis. So this is a slide I think is most important. And I like to bring this up to a lot of my patients because they often ask, hey, I've had this murmur for 50 years. I'm getting a little short of breath, but I've been told I have aortic stenosis. And you know what? I really don't feel that bad. I just feel a little fatigued. But when you look at this slide, you can see the latent period. It takes decades for the condition to develop where symptoms start. So you can see from age zero to age 65 around there, there's not many symptomatic changes. But then you see once the severe symptoms start, the drop is dramatic. Hence, when I see a patient with severe aortic stenosis documented by an ultrasound echocardiogram, and they're, they're saying I'm a little fatigued, a little short of breath, I try to explain to them that the next stage of the process is usually quite quick after that. Symptoms do come quick, and if they do on, come on the onset, the survivability is very low. Survival after the onset of symptoms is 50% at two years and 20% at five years. Hence, we try to be proactive, not reactive, when patients come in with these issues. It's a sobering perspective. 10 years ago, the five-year survival for severe inoperable AS was less than a number of the cancers that we see every day out there. And why is that? Because, to be honest, to operate on a, someone with severe aortic stenosis who has comorbid issues, the risk of coming off the table or risk of dying is quite high. Hence, surgeons were hesitant to take a lot of these patients on. But we know if you replace the aortic valve, you can greatly improve someone's survival, not just the quality of life. And I tell this to patients oftentimes, sure, I don't want you to be fatigued. I don't want the shortness of breath. I don't want you to have those symptoms, but I want to increase your survival. I want to make sure you live as quality life as you can. And we know from data, if you get in and get in early and replace that valve, patients tend to do extremely well. But again, I'm going back to that slide where surgeons historically were not operating on a lot of these patients because when patients came in with end stage or critical aortic stenosis, oftentimes they have heart failure. They have, they have other conditions which would make them high risk for surgery. So there were so many of these patients coming through that medicine overall had to figure out how are we going to treat these patients? Well, we know aortic valve replacement becomes riskier with an older population. Longer hospital stays, rehab, comorbid issues are major factors. Again, the last 10 years, we've seen a revolution in aortic stenosis therapy. And TAVR, which is called transcatheter aortic valve replacement, also known as TAV, transcatheter aortic valve implantation in Europe, same procedure, just different terminology, has become a viable technology. Now, people say to me, well, okay, hold on. How about medications? Why can't I just take a medication to treat my aortic stenosis? And that's the problem. Aortic stenosis is not a physiologic problem as much as an anatomic problem. There's no way to get rid of that calcium that builds up on the valve that prevents it from opening with any medication. So if someone is short of breath from aortic stenosis, I could give them a water pill to get some of the fluid off their lungs, but that's not gonna take away the underlying problem of the valve. Hence, you need to either get rid of that stenosis by a valve or a balloon or somewhere in between, but you have to do something. And as we've seen in the past, in the last 40, 50 years, just ballooning a valve that is stenotic doesn't necessarily keep it open. So again, we had to make a decision. If we can't do open heart surgery, how can we get a valve in a patient without opening their chest? And what is TAVR? Well, that's exactly it. It's putting a new valve in the, in the aortic valve without opening the chest. It's an alternative to traditional open heart surgery. And currently in the US, we have three options that are FDA approved. The Edward Sapien valve, which was the first valve approved back in 2011, followed quickly by the Medtronic core valve. And recently, in the last six months, we've seen the Abbott Portico Taver valve, which just got approved, but it's only indicated for high-risk or inoperable patients. 
The Edwards valve and the Medtronic core valve are approved for low risk, intermediate, and high risk patients. So basically anybody who is deemed a suitable candidate for this can get those two valves. Briefly, I'd like to talk about the newest data that came out about the Medtronic core valve. Excellent results from multiple studies. We know that recent studies have shown better results with using the Medtronic core valve in high risk patients rather than open heart surgery. Why is this a big thing? Because as opposed to the mitral clip, which is a procedure that's very good, but surgery is still the gold standard, we now have a procedure that goes through the artery in the leg that's actually shown to be better than traditional open heart surgery. So this is quite exciting. However, TAVR has only been approved for, or been around for 10 years in FDA approval. Hence, we talk about long-term durability about these valves. So again, we all oftentimes want to make sure that when we have a discussion with the patient, it's not just me. It's my partners, Dr. Mahan and Dr. O'Hare, my open heart surgical partners, will all meet with the patient and will say, what's the best therapy for you? Not necessarily, it's the easiest procedure to do. Because remember, we want to make sure that patients have the longest life possible, not just quality. And again, sometimes we may need to do further procedures in the future if one of these valves obviously deteriorates or has an issue. So in summary, heart valve disease is growing in the US population. We need alternatives to standard surgical therapy for patients who are high risk for complications. And TAVR and MitraClip represent the forefront of these therapies, but they're certainly not the last. So I'm gonna show a video of the TAVR procedure. And before I do that, I also wanna comment what also has changed the procedure itself. Well, I have to tell you something. When patients come to see me now, it used to be back in the day, the question was, how good is the procedure? Or how can you put that through my artery? Or is there issues with my heart when you do it? Now the procedure has gotten much more slick. It's gotten a lot easier to perform. Patients tolerate it better. The number one question I get, how do you prevent a stroke? Because patients often say, hey, hey, I get it. I like the fact the valve, I don't have to open my chest but I don't want to get anything in my brain. I don't want to have a stroke during the procedure. So on top of this procedure, the TAVR procedure, a new device came out to protect the brain from hopefully any debris coming off the valve when we put the new TAVR valve in. And that's called the Sentinel Cerebral Protection Device. And interestingly enough, not every site in the country that performs TAVR utilizes it. I'm proud to say here at Boulder Community Health that if a patient has the anatomy suitable for this device, we will use it 100% of the time. So at this point, I wanna show everybody what the TAVR procedure looks like, and then I'm gonna follow it up with what that Sentinel procedure looks like during the TAVR. So here we have the beating heart. And what we're looking at now is a closer look at the aortic valve. And this is a normal aortic valve. And as time elapses, this is what shows you what a stenotic aortic valve looks. Basically calcified and restricted and not opening well. And that stress of the valve not opening puts stress on the heart Hence why the heart becomes larger and larger and becomes more muscular and over time can fail, causing heart failure. So we go through 98% of the time an artery in your leg, an artery in your neck, or a space between your ribs. The top two, we rarely use. I would say 98% of the procedures we perform in this current age is through the artery in the leg. We go up with the wire and the catheter. The wire will cross the stenotic valve. We then place the Medtronic core valve in, which is a TAVR. This is a pig valve. The Edwards valve is a cow valve, but they're both bioprosthetic, so they do not require long-term anticoagulation therapy. We place the valve in place. And you can see you have a brand new valve functioning immediately. And then we pull the wire back and guess what? 
the old valve acts as concrete. It keeps the new valve in place and your valve is functioning immediately with no sutures, no staples, nothing of that sort. So that's how amazing it is that we can place a new valve in the old valve in a span of an hour or hour and a half and the valve is functioning immediately. And the groin will then be closed with internal sutures so there'll be no cutting onto the artery and patients are often discharged within 24 hours. But I wanted to also show, well, guess what? Doing that procedure, what are the risks? Well, we just talked about a few of them and one of the things that people have noticed is that if you're putting a new valve in an old valve, there's bound to have some calcium that might break off and cause some issues. So into this, this device called the Sentinel came about. This is a pigtail catheter showing what the arteries of the neck and the head look like. Coming from the right wrist, a catheter is placed down. A filter is released into one of the main arteries called the innominate artery, which protects the right carotid artery. We then put a wire into the left common carotid artery and place another filter there. Now the taver valve goes by and that little white things, those little calcium spots are picked up by the filter. And at the end of the procedure, we pull the filter back. And pull the whole system out of the body. So it does not remain. So at this point, what we have seen is that not only has open heart surgery transformed itself into something that's done via an artery, We've also seen that there's protection that we're trying to implement in patients who are getting these procedures. So these are just evolution of therapy that have been around for about the last 10 years. I'm gonna be honest, it's gonna be amazing what we're gonna see in the next 10 years coming. We have a number of other things that we perform at Boulder Community Health via percutaneous approach, but for the sake of tonight's talk, we really wanted to hone in on these two specific areas to really let everyone know that Number one, if you have these conditions, if you have these symptoms, don't hesitate to come see your physician. I can't tell you, even today, I had a patient who had severe aortic stenosis, but was absolutely petrified about getting open heart surgery and had put off coming to a doctor for years because the thought was he had to get open heart surgery. And there are times where you may need to get open heart, but in this time frame, and where we're at now, don't put off your symptoms because of you're worried about the treatment. Come in, talk to your doctors, let us discuss and see if there's options for you. And obviously, at the end of the day, the most important person in the room is always the patient. So obviously we wanna do something that's going to help you, but also mindful of coming down the line in the future of what else may be needed to treat you as well. And with that, I'd like to open the floor up to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Iyengar, always so informational. We have a few questions. We do want to remind our audience that they can um, ask their questions uh, below the video, and we'll get to as many as we can tonight. The first one um, has some different parts to it, but I'll see how to get through this one. I have a loose tricuspid valve. How do you know if you need a loose valve procedure? Is there a diagnostic test and are there certain symptoms? So the question is a loose or leaky tricuspid valve. That's one of the valves we did not discuss tonight, but it's a very important valve. It's a right-sided valve. It connects the right atrium to the right ventricle. This valve is very oftentimes leaky. I will tell you that right now, when we perform an ultrasound of someone's heart, you almost always see a little bit of leaking across the valve because it doesn't have as much strong or strength compared to the mitral or aortic valves, but it's still a very important valve. So how do we diagnose it? Well, first and foremost, a physical exam, taking a stethoscope, listening to the patients. Obviously, that will be one of the first signs of noticing if there is any murmur that can give away that there is a valvular heart problem. Second, we can oftentimes see the leaking very clearly on an echocardiogram. So if you have an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart, and shows that leaking tricuspid valve, well then in that case, 
we will then go forward with saying, is there any symptoms? So if there are symptoms, which would be considered usually swelling of the abdomen or legs because fluid is going backwards down into the veins of the leg, that would be an indication potentially to be on a water pill or and to look at your lungs to see why the tricuspid valve is leaking. Because a lot of times the tricuspid valve leaks because of an underlying lung problem like COPD or emphysema, which causes high pressures in the lung to push pressure back on the tricuspid valve. If that isn't the problem and you just have a leaky tricuspid valve because maybe an infection sat into the valve, well, in that case, surgery would be the standard of care. There would not be an option currently like what we have now, but we think in the next year or two, there might be a mitral clip for the tricuspid valve. It's called triclip. It's not available yet, but we suspect in the next year or two, it might be coming out. That's good to know that they're always um, doing development and research. It sounds like the last 10 years have been uh, really a good time to see all of that. Right, and I just it's really amazing that every valve in the heart can be reached some way or another by a, a, a procedure through the vein or the artery versus open heart surgery. What we need and what we should expect from this is that it should be equivalent or better than surgery. So a lot of times we just don't want to put something in that's okay. It should be expected that we should give patients the best benefit of the therapy. Okay. Why does the patient have to be high risk in order to get the clip? So I get this, patient, this question all the time. I have patients coming in and saying, you know what, I saw your talk, I saw the information, I don't want open heart surgery. So this is the reasoning is because mitral clip has not eclipsed or, or is not an equivalent to surgery. A surgeon, when they open up your chest, they can actually repair the valve in numerous ways, put a ring around the valve to tighten it up. They can do numerous things to the valve to make it obviously leak less. The mitral clip is really just that, a clip. So we can put more than one clip in, but it will not be equivalent to a strong, durable surgical result. So at this point in time, we have not yet developed a percutaneous option that's equivalent to surgery in the mitral space. Hence why if a patient can get surgery, we oftentimes say the low risk patients can get a robot because that's usually the procedure we get, uh, Dr. O'Hare will utilize for patients in their 50s, 60s, and 70s potentially. Open heart surgery for the patients a little bit older or a little bit more risk factors. But the mitral clip, because again, it's not equivalent to surgery, would be reserved for the highest risk patients who cannot do well with surgery. Okay, that clarifies that, thank you. Um, this person says they have a 10-year-old mitral valve repair. Can the mitral clip be used? So great question, because in the world of mitral valve surgery, there are mitral valve replacements, there's mitral valve repair. And if you have a mitral valve repair, there's certain things that can be done, like I just mentioned, whether it be a ring or a tightening of one of the leaflets. So the thing is, in a mitral valve repair, in this situation with this question, if it is leaking significantly, the answer is most likely yes. Depending on the anatomy, a clip can usually be placed in a patient who's had a mitral valve repair. Now, if a patient has had a mitral valve replacement, now I don't want to get everybody confused, but the replacement means a brand new valve in the mitral valve space, and it starts having problems, we can actually put a TAVR valve in that valve if needed, if that valve is having problems. So there's multiple ways of approaching this. So it's not just a one uh, trick pony situation. Depending on what you've had performed, oftentimes we can do something without repeat open heart surgery for these conditions. Okay, sounds good. Can TAVR be used for aortic regurgitation? So this is another hot button issue. People will say, okay, you talked about aortic stenosis. How about aortic regurgitation? How about a leaky aortic valve? Why can't you put a TAVR in there? because it's the same space, it's the same valve, why can't you just put a bigger version of it in? Well, let me tell you why, and I think it comes down to like home building, basically. 
When I mentioned the aortic stenosis and the new valve being placed in there, what did I say? I said concrete. The old valve, the calcium, acts as foundation for the TAVR valve to sit properly so it does not move. Aortic regurgitation is usually a floppy, leaking aortic valve. Hence, it's not really concrete. It's pretty much like uh, soft sand. It's hard for keeping anything in place in that area. So if we try to put a TAVR valve in a leaking aortic valve, chances are the valve is gonna move up and down. It's not gonna sit properly. So that being said, one of the biggest Achilles heel of TAVR was leaking aortic valves. So what has been developed, again, coming in the next, hopefully, one to two years, is a dedicated valve just for leaking aortic valves. We're hoping, I am being very optimistic, but I'm thinking in the next two years, there should be something that's FDA approved, hopefully, that will treat a leaking aortic valve. Thank you. Uh, is the surgery to repair or replace a mitral valve open heart surgery? Correct. So the surgery to replace or repair a mitral valve is either literally open chest surgery, open heart surgery, or it can be done via a robot which goes through the side of the chest through basically incisions that are nowhere as big as traditional open heart surgery. My partner, Dr. O'Hare, performs robotic mitral valve surgery, actually has the highest volume in the state of Colorado of robotic mitral valve surgery. But because the surgery is less intense on the heart itself, as in there's less exposure, it's reserved for the lower risk patients most of the time. If you're a higher risk patient, like you have a lot of calcium around the mitral valve, or you have another valve that needs to be operated on, both our surgeons and most surgeons in general will go back to a traditional open chest procedure. So this one is also fairly specific. It's for a 68-year-old male, 4.8 centimeter ascending aorta mm -hmm. aneurysm with bicuspid valve, 105 calcium score. What might be the next steps? So with someone of this nature, the biggest thing that stands out actually is the ascending aorta at 4.8 centimeters. So first I would ask this patient to see if there's any history of how, how big this aorta was. And the aorta is the artery that attaches to the aortic valve because if it is indeed 4.8 and it was say 4.3 a year ago, I would be concerned that the growth of that aorta would necessitate a surgical intervention. That bicuspid valve isn't as concerning if it's not stenotic or leaking. The calcium score, which he just mentioned, is just an indication of calcium in the coronary arteries. To really know if there's any blockages, they would need a heart catheterization to look at the arteries or a CAT scan to look at the arteries per se, not a calcium score. So the first thing I would do with this individual would say is, let's get that scan, let's look at that ultrasound and make sure it's accurate. If, there is, if it is somewhat accurate, I would then get the CT scan to look at that aorta. And then, if it is indeed that large, I think we need to bring our surgeon involved to have a discussion to say about timing of what to do about that aorta. Okay. So you mentioned that the valves, uh, I think here in England was what you mentioned, one was pig and one was cow. Um, is that correct that well, those are the two um, uh, animals that are used yeah, for so that? Yes, in, in, so in Europe we call it TAVI, in the US we call it TAVR, they're the same thing, it's just a different letter, they use implantation, we say replacement, it's just, it's like meters and feet, I mean we just have different issues over here compared to Europe, but the valves in the Medtronic core valve, that is porcine, which is a pig valve, and then you have the Edwards valve, which is bovine, is a cow valve, and that's just how the two companies develop their valves with those respective animals. Is there a risk with allergies um, by having uh, those animals as part of the valve? Well, you know, amazingly, I've never seen a rejection based on the animal product because they're denatured, which means that they've been treated and processed so many times over. I've yet to see anyone have a reaction to the valve. However, I have seen patients who have nickel allergies who may have had reactions to some of these components because some of the components of the valve are nickel titanium. So if you do have a metal allergy, 
That is something to always tell your physician. Even forget the heart. Anything you get in your body, whether it be your teeth or, your, or a hip replacement, an allergy to metal is a serious issue if you really have it and you really want to tell your physician about that beforehand. So the animal products, I have yet to see anybody have rejection, but the metal products, I actually have noticed people can have a reaction to. Okay, good to know. What symptoms are most important to watch for in cases of AS? The biggest thing I will say to anybody who has aortic stenosis, if you read the books, it talks about chest pain, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, and I say, that's not what I'm looking for initially because I will tell you the number one symptom I see out of my patient population is fatigue. Not shortness of breath, but fatigue, as in, I can't walk the flight of stairs today as fast as I did six months ago. Or when I go out for my walk, I can do a mile in Chautauqua, but I can't do any more without taking a break. So that's not really shortness of breath, that's just a lack of energy, that's lethargy. Fatigue is different. Because when I tell patients, are you short of breath, they always say, no, I'm not short of breath, I can breathe fine, I sit here, I'm breathing fine. It's fatigue is the first major symptom that I've noticed of patients when they develop symptoms of severe aortic stenosis. So I always ask everyone, I understand you're not sitting here short of breath, but if I asked you to go up the foothills or the stairs or down the hall, what you've done six months ago, do you feel the same? And if they start saying, you know, I go a little slower, you know, I get a little bit more tired halfway up, but I can still finish. Those are the signs that something is changing. That's good to know because there are several different symptoms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a structural cardiologist says Ross ASAP, though he is mostly asymptomatic with mild stenosis. So I'm sorry, I didn't get that, that question. If that doesn't make sense, then the person needs to retype. That's what it's saying. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't understand that question. No worries, thank you. Just one second, please. Um, what about the Ross procedure? My 25-year-old son was diagnosed with bicuspid aortic valve as a baby. One group is saying wait and see, another is saying no. The Ross procedure is a procedure where the actual, if the aortic valve is diseased, what happens is that we take the aortic valve out, it's a surgical procedure, the pulmonic valve is then placed in the aortic position, and then you have a bioprosthetic aortic valve placed in the pulmonic position. So what you're doing is you're putting a bioprosthetic valve in the pulmonary you know, valve and taking the pulmonic valve and putting it in the aortic position. A lot of patients have had this procedure done. It's quite elegant, it's skilled. It is not something that we routinely do. The main reason is because we've seen degeneration of these valves as time goes on. So the thought is if someone should be developing degeneration of either the pulmonic or the aortic valve, it then comes down to the risk of surgery of having another open heart surgery versus which valve is causing the issues. Because patients seem to tolerate a pulmonary valve leaking or being tight better than they, treat, they, they tolerate an aortic valve leaking or being tight. So it really does come down to which valve is the problem and what are the symptoms associated. Okay. This person has an MV with regurgitation and one side is scalloped. What might be the best treatment for them? They are 75 and otherwise in good health. Well, the question is, is if the mitral valve has basically leaking, but maybe not the anatomy that's perfect for the clip. And then in this situation, I wouldn't do anything unless there's symptoms. Number one, we want to make sure there's no symptoms or there are symptoms before we introduce a therapy that may or may not be needed. If the, if the leaking is severe and the muscle function is getting less than normal, even if the patient is asymptomatic, I would still suggest a surgical consultation because in that case, that tells you that the heart muscle might be dysfunctional. Even if the patient denies symptoms, I would still be worried that going forward, there would be really a negative outcome there. So I would suggest in this particular situation, a surgical consultation only if a cardiologist has already seen her or him 
to basically evaluate them to make sure to say, okay, can we treat this with medications? Is this something that's changing? Do we need to repeat an ultrasound in six months? Or do we need to get our surgeons involved sooner? Okay. Uh, so this is kind of a current question. Uh -huh. Does COVID affect people with valve disease more severely? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because in the last two years, as everyone has seen, we don't know much about COVID because it seems to hit every part of the body and we're all getting these after effects of COVID potentially and saying, does it affect brain function, heart function, liver, kidney, you name it. Acutely, we have seen a number of cases of COVID causing inflammation of the heart, as in the heart sac, pericarditis or myocarditis. We've seen COVID cause clot development in the body, sometimes causing clots in the arteries of the heart, causing heart attacks. I've yet to see COVID directly affect valvular function. So we know it can cause clot uh, in the arteries, and we know it can affect the muscle and the sac around the muscle, but valvular function is not something we've classically seen yet from an COVID, active COVID infection or from post-COVID uh, long-haul syndrome. Are you guys still watching that? It's a kind of development and process it's, then? Uh, exactly. It's, it's really, it's, we're, we're, we're living in the now. You know, it's hard to say that you, we're gonna, we can foretell what's going to happen because, again, we think we're through the pandemic. We don't know the next round is going to happen. So by next year this time, we'll have three years of data of people with COVID and post-COVID to understand if it's affected anything. Okay. Thank you. Glad that the scientists are keeping up with all of that. <laughs> How long from the time it's decided that a valve repair is needed and when the procedure can be done? So normally I would tell you that it comes down to the patient. If someone comes into the ER and they're in heart failure because of a torn cord on their mitral valve or because their heart muscle is dysfunctional, oftentimes that surgery is immediately if they need it. Now if someone is stable and having a very leaky valve, we oftentimes say we can definitely move that surgery up, say within the month if needed to get that patient taken care of, but it is really patient specific because if a patient is asymptomatic and the valve is leaking severely and there's no dysfunction of the muscle, theoretically, we could wait a month or two before doing something. So it really comes down to how symptomatic the person is, how dysfunctional the valve and the muscle is, and then kind of putting it together and making a decision and a plan of action. Okay. Um, this person said this might be a little off topic, but we'll put this your way, okay? Uh, is there a specialist in ascending aortic aneurysm repair in the front range area? So basically, yes, and it's not an off topic at all because the ascending aorta is attached to the aortic valve. So we had a question about four or five questions ago asked if someone has a bicuspid aortic valve and a dilated ascending aorta, well, what do you do? Well, this happens quite often. When we see a bicuspid aortic valve, we oftentimes see a dilated ascending aorta. So unfortunately, there isn't any way to do a, a repair of the ascending aorta with a catheter and a stent. I repair with Dr. Rohan and Dr. Mahan descending dilated aortas with a stent graft but because the ascending aorta attaches to the coronary arteries, right now there is no device on the market that's even there that we can place via the groin. So realistically, an expert that deals with this is a surgeon. And I would say Dr. Mahan and Dr. O'Hare, my colleagues, would be the ones that I would refer anybody with an ascending dilated aorta for open surgery repair. Okay. Um, so you talked about a few of the devices may have a 10-year uh, durability, but it's just that the device is newer. Uh, you did talk about several devices. Um, what are the durability of the devices? So again, we have data only since these devices were released. So it's not like we have 50 years of data with surgical valves. And to be honest, there's not one surgical valve. There's probably 20 different types of surgical valves that have been out in the market over the last 50 years. A lot of them are not in the market anymore because they didn't last. 
So that's how, in this situation, we are trying to be more pragmatic. We don't want 20 different tavern valves. We want some very good tavern valves, you know, two or three potentially. So with the Medtronic core valve, we have now data, hard data, eight years out that shows excellent durability. And that study was published last year. So we're looking at coming on to next year, hopefully we'll have 10 year data about this valve. Again though, we're limited because TAVR only came into existence in the, from the FDA approval situation in 2011. So we really don't have a lot of running room, but the data that's being presented, and actually Dr. O'Hare, my partner, just presented at the American College of Cardiology, data out five years from the higher risk patients and intermediate risk patients that shows that TAVR was superior to surgical valves and durability. I'm gonna be honest, I have to feel that if we are putting these valves in now, that we have a very good chance of seeing them last at least as long as a surgical valve. But you know, again, time will tell because I cannot predict a 15 year durability when I only have 10 years of data. Okay. Um, would you have uh, heart symptoms again and that's how you would know? Uh, that it's failing or that you need to go see the doctor if you're at the end of that 10-year period? Well, I'll tell you, it's interesting. So last week or a few weeks ago, we placed a valve in a surgical valve that had deteriorated. A patient had a surgically placed valve and the leaflet stopped working well and he started having a lot of leaking. He was asymptomatic, but we placed a valve in that valve and it worked wonderfully. And that's pretty much a standard of care that if a valve is failing, a surgical valve, we can put in a TAVR valve as long as it's not a mechanical valve. That's a different situation. Those are valves that need blood thinning medication and those, unfortunately, when they don't work, they need to be surgically explanted. But if a patient says, hey, I don't feel bad. How do you know I need to get my valve fixed? We oftentimes say ultrasound, echocardiograms, usually yearly after you get one of these valves to keep an eye on it or symptoms. If someone starts saying, you know what, I'm getting short of breath again, just like I was years ago before I had this valve, how do I know it's not that? Well, the physical exam, you can hear a murmur, you can oftentimes tell that something's occurring, and then the echocardiogram would be there to verify your findings. Okay. Let's talk insurance. So, um, you've talked about uh, sometimes using the devices rather than having open heart surgery. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's regular insurance until you get Medicare. Um, can you talk to mm -hmm. some of those points and the coverage on right. that? Right, and these, these devices are not investigational. So everything I've spoken about tonight is FDA approved. And that's why when we talk to patients about these therapies, we're not trying to offer them an off-label approach or say, well, you know, we should just try this because it's less invasive. That's not the indication. These valves, the TAVR valves and the MitraClip are all FDA approved, so hence insurance covers all of these procedures as long as we are doing them in the proper scenario. So putting a mitral clip in a different type of valve or using a TAVR valve in a different you know, scenario, you, if you stick to the guidelines of why these, these devices were created, insurance will cover 100% of their utilization. Okay. Um. Do you sometimes not know you have a heart problem until you have a heart attack? And can these repairs be done post heart attack? So definitely, I will tell you, unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there who don't know they have a heart condition until too late. And for example, the classic example of the guy out there golfing who has a heart attack and drops dead on the golf course. And people have heard that story a thousand times and they say, how did that happen? Well, the individual didn't realize there was something going on prior to that event. So number one, if you have risk factors, if you smoke, stop smoking, number one, but if you are overweight and not exercising enough, you have diabetes, if you have a family history of heart disease, these are things that I would tell you to talk to your primary care doctor and say, should I be on a cholesterol lowering medication? Should I be taking a baby aspirin? Should I get screened? for any other problems like a coronary calcium score or stress test or something else. Now, if you did get diagnosed with a heart problem and had a heart attack hypothetically, yes, you can still get any of these procedures because obviously what we're treating with these valvular procedures is usually different than the underlying event of a heart attack. Okay. 
Can you remind us of some of the symptoms of heart attacks um, and some of the differences between men and women as they uh, manifest? So classically, in all the textbooks, you would see, you know, the white 50-year-old male, you know, shoveling snow and grabbing the left side of his chest and the pain down his arm and to his jaw. That's how we were all taught of the classic heart attack approach or what patients present with. Women, however, can oftentimes present differently. Nausea, irritable, mid-chest mid area discomfort, throat pain, back pain are all potential symptoms of a coronary problem in women as well. And also another population, men or women, that can present differently, diabetics. Oftentimes, their pain fibers can be different and their pain responses can be different than patients without diabetes. Now, that being said, I don't want everyone at home to be scared to say, oh my God, I had a little back pain, I'm having a heart attack. However, these are things to understand that a heart attack doesn't always follow the playbook. It's not always left-sided, left arm, jaw. It can be other, <coughs> excuse me, other places as well. I oftentimes tell patients, if you are getting a little bit of discomfort in your stomach or your, or your throat, take an antacid. Let's see, let's rule the quick things out quickly. If that doesn't get better and you realize you're still having discomfort, maybe it's time to pick up the phone or get to the ER and get there and get evaluated. I never feel bad when a patient says to me, I'm so sorry I had to call you in, I didn't realize it was just bad acid reflux. I said, hey, it's better to be acid reflux in the ER than a heart attack at home. There we go. A uh, couple of quick questions, then we're gonna wrap it up. Mm -hmm. um, is plaque the same as calcium? So that's a good question, because people will say, I have a calcium score of 500. Does that mean I have plaque in my arteries? No, it just means that the calcium deposition that is there can be in the artery, around the artery, but doesn't necessarily have to be blocking the artery. But plaque, when people see plaque disease, like on a carotid ultrasound, that is usually in the artery. And when I do an angiogram and I see plaque, that's usually in the artery. So when I see plaque, that doesn't mean you have a blocked artery. That just means you have the development of a potential blockage if it's untreated. So those are the patients I would say, go ahead on a cholesterol-lowering medication like a statin, like a Lipitor or a Crestor. That's usually the mainstay of therapy for those types of patients. Okay. And then uh, this last one, uh, this person at three-year-old had open heart mitral valve repair. They're 66 now, starting to feel that tired shortness of breath. Uh, they are not able to see their car cardiologist, didn't say why, uh, suggestions. So unfortunately, it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of leaving it a little bit vague because if you can't see your cardiologist, then I would say see another cardiologist you know, see another specialist. And if it's my group, we'll try to find someone else in the group that can see you because I feel that it's important that if the symptoms are starting and there is a history of mitral valve surgery, well, at the very least, I don't want someone to feel like they have to go to the ER to be seen for this condition. So at very least for this person, I would say, see another specialist, try to find another specialist, or if not, heck, we'll try to get them in anywhere in our office. Thank you very much. We've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org backslash live stream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email. Please take a minute to fill this out. Again, please visit bch.org for information on the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you for joining us and have a good night. <laughs>